we want to turn our focus to the STD revenge killing trial in Pensacola, Florida, which we showed our viewers uh, most of yesterday. Yeah, the jury reached its verdict yesterday, and um, what happened in court is uh, very compelling because uh, we're going to bring it all to you uh, right now, in fact, because uh, we, not everybody was able to see that. Right, and of course, Keith Ag right there on the screen, he was accused of shooting and killing 18-year-old Brooklyn Sims after receiving a positive STD test just days after being intimate with Sims. And he said that uh, the mother of his two-year-old daughter, um, well, he basically said that she gave him this STD. She, he went to her workplace at a local Home Depot, uh, and uh, he shot her, and everybody saw that video. And, of course, he testified. We played that. He admitted to shooting her uh, in a very odd way. It was like he was smiling at times as he was remembering mm. yeah, this robotic. with pleasure. It was really disgusting. Let's take a, a watch at the uh, verdict. In the circuit court for Escambia County, Florida, state of Florida plaintiff versus Keith Eric Aji, defendant. Clerk number 1723CF003379A, zero zero three three seven nine Division A. Verdict. We, the jury, find as follows as to the counts charged in the indictment. Count one, guilty of first degree murder as charged. Count two, not guilty. So say we all this 20th day of December, 2023. Okay, of course, after that, it was right to the sentencing phase uh, and, and Brooklyn Sims mother uh, testified. She was very emotional and take a look. The actions of Pete A.G. greatly affected my life. As some of you may know, Brooklyn was my friend and a co-worker that I formed the bottle with Brad to know Brooklyn and to love her. She had a smile, always smiled at a smile that was brighter than the sun. She had a voice that she could decide who we could ask for. Brooklyn was a daughter, a sister, a friend, and most of all, a mother. Seeing Mason's face to face, I put it in the face, always very sweet to my eyes. Because not only did she lose her mother, she lost her father and her grandmother as well. She had to grow up with each parent in her life, and that will hurt some of the I can't give it to her. 
from raising his daughter. That day, Casey lost her mother, her father, and her brother. I know that life without parole is on the table for him. Maybe he'll be able to get himself together for Casey soon. Because one day she's going to ask him about this, and he is going to have to explain that to her. All right, that was uh, the victim impact statements. And when this was all done, something crazy was revealed. Like, remember that supposedly the reason he was going there was because she gave him an STD. Well, guess what? We're going to take a break and Don't tell you. Don't give it you. away. Yeah. It was a bombshell. The final piece of evidence. Don't want to miss it. Stay with us. Stay with us. Tonight on Court TV. These are the big cases that everyone is talking about. A lot of new developments taking place. Shocking. I know who killed John Bonet, to say the least. You cannot make this stuff up. It's uh, unreal. The scene of the double murders is behind us right here. Things are happening. The investigation is continuing. Closing arguments with Vinny Politan tonight at 8, 7 central, only on Court TV. Live along with Chandler Painter and Ted Rollins, we have been watching the end of the murder trial for Keith Agee. That's right. A jury found him guilty after about three hours of deliberations yesterday of first degree premeditated murder for the death of 18 year old Brooklyn Sims. And he took the stand. He told the jury that he did, in fact, shoot Sims in the heat of the moment after finding out he tested positive for an STD after he had been intimate with her a few days earlier. Yes. And then a major bombshell. A major bombshell in this trial. Uh, after the verdict, the state submitted one little final piece of evidence, and uh, boy, it really throws this whole thing into another layer of disgustingness. Take a look. Some pictures of Brooklyn's daughter, Casey. Well, if I made a proof, I know the family wants to back. Yes. <clears throat> She didn't have gonorrhea at all in the first place. She didn't even have it. Ugh. It died for absolutely nothing. Yeah, horrible. Um, Josh Schiffer and Jack Rice still with us. Yeah, it's a, I mean, unbelievable. This case is so sad on so many levels. Josh, you first. Uh, it's the example right from the textbook of people not handling anger issues and having the tools to handle anger issues and then the access to firearms. 
because what we've got is someone who I'm not saying he's made good decisions or bad decisions for his entire life, but there is zero justification for a rational person to go and shoot and murder or assault someone just for giving them a curable medical condition. This, this is absolutely horrific, but it's an example of the exact kind of situation where no firearm should be present. No firearm should be anywhere within grabbing reach of people when they are having an emotional crisis. And this guy's even getting egged on by his mom mm -hmm. who works at the same Home Depot. And he says immediately, I've made a horrible mistake. We're not talking about someone who's incompetent. No, they were blinded by rage and anger and had an ultra hazardous instrumentality right there. Yeah, talk about that mother, Jack. What mother is texting her son saying, uh, language I can't use on television, if you don't go shoot this woman, here's, here's the address, here's where she's working, here's where you can find her, just make sure you don't shoot me when you go into the store and take care of business. Yeah, this is brutal, Channeling. It's brutal, and, and this, this is pointless. And I mean, what makes this so terrible is this was pointless if there were an STD, okay? If that were the case, this is the pointlessness of that. And then you pull that rug out from under this, and it makes it just feel hollow even more pointless than it was previously. And that's really the difficulty that we face sometimes because the motivations behind people, their justifications, and then their ability to get access to some instrument, and that can be a knife, a gun, their own hands, and then to not be able to control themselves. And you wanna be able to say, I, I just wanna stop you and tell you this one thing as we watch this. And that's really the tragedy, because when we deal with this on a daily basis, as we walk into courtrooms, as I did just this morning, you realize that so much of this could have been stopped. So much of this could have been addressed earlier on. But once you get down a certain path, then you're stuck with these facts. And you watch them, and you think of these family members during their victim statements and what they've lost you realize the tragedy of this. Because I have to tell you, when I think about these kinds of issues, sometimes what happens is we think about this technically in terms of what we do, how you try a case, how you defend a case, what are the elements of a charge, how do you deal with an opening or a closing? But in the end, what this is really about is the heart and the soul and the blood and the hope that is taken away from these families and that's the tragedy of this and then you hollow it out with oh by the way she had no std it's heartbreaking it sure heartbreaking. is um the defendant took the stand of course in this case and he testified at one point about being intimate with brooklyn sims and uh, was also asked about being be, being intimate with someone else let's watch when was the last time you two were together sexually romantically the prior weekend um, from August the 11th. The weekend before she died? Yes, sir. Uh, what did you do? How did you spend that weekend? We mostly stayed watching movies, joking and laughing, and uh, playing with my two-year-old, my now two-year-old. At some point that day, you discover you had been diagnosed with uh, gonorrhea? Yes, sir. How did you find that out? I received the call from Greater Mobile Urgent Care. When had you uh, when had you taken a, an STD test? The following, the before Tuesday to that date. Tuesday prior to the shooting? Yes, sir. Why did you have that test done? I started uh, experiencing abnorm abnormalities that I've never had while peeing and uh, resting and sitting down. Uh, now, have you ever had a sexually transmitted disease before? Never in my life. Other than the weekend, was that after, immediately after the weekend you had spent with Brooklyn? Yes, sir. The following Tuesday, I got a test. Have you been sexually active with anyone else? Not for almost two months with anybody else. 
Uh, so, um, Josh, that was him on the stand, and uh, basically, you know, he got it wrong. And to Chanley's point, mom really dropped the ball because mom is the one that's supposed to take care of your child and say, everything's okay. You know, we're going to get through this. Go to the doctor, get a prescription. They, they just taken time. Yeah. To, they would have found out. Brooklyn. Yes, they would have found out. It, she wasn't the source of this disease. Right. And, and in fact, mom's at the Home Depot. She could have talked yeah. to Brooklyn. Exactly. This is the ultimate example of he just needed to take a lap for a minute, let everybody calm down, and then think about the situation. The, the rush to judgment, which we talk about all the time because that's how people get lost. You, you, you think one thing and you act on it and it's all right and that's your confirmation and you're going to confirm your biases already. No, no. Step back, take a breath, look at different perspectives. I mean, who thinks that harming the parent of their toddler is going to solve anything? What kind of grandmother thinks that harming the mother of their grandbaby would bring any positivity to the family situation. Yeah, and so when he was sentenced, this convicted murderer, he actually did speak. What did he say? How did he say it? Was it better than his testimony? Was he smiling while he had to say this at sentencing? <laughs> We're gonna find out. We're gonna watch his statement to the judge right after this quick break on Court TV. The front row seat to justice. Coming soon to Court TV. These murders have shaken our community. Why did you do it? The doomsday prophet, Chad Daybell. Prosecutors say they will seek the death penalty against him. A social media sensation, now a suspected killer. Karen Reed, she's accused of murder. She says she's the victim of a police cover-up. It's scary just knowing that he was so close. The high-stakes trials you don't want to miss. Coming soon, only on Court TV. Welcome back to Court TV Live. I'm Chanley Painter along with Ted Rollins. Thanks for being with us today. We are awaiting a judge's decision in the Bahamas. There's a live look outside the courthouse where Lindsay Sharp is going to find out if she can travel to the United States to see her kids over the Christmas holiday. And of course, we have Matt Johnson there, boots on the ground inside that courthouse to bring us any and all updates. And what we've been hearing so far is that Shiver, of course, in the courtroom, is emotional while waiting for the judge. It actually just started moments ago with our latest update. Yeah, so as soon as that uh, hearing is over, Matt will uh, fill us in and uh, tell us what this judge has decided in terms of travel for Lindsay Shiver. If you missed earlier, Robert Shiver, the husband, which was the, he was the subject of this alleged hit, he actually zoomed into the courtroom and, and expressed to the judge, please don't let her come back because I am nervous. Yeah, I don't blame him. I mean, yeah, it, and, and for young children like that too, Ted, it has to be unstable, right, to have a consistent way yeah. for a bit and reintroduce something. So he has some concerns, but again, we will see what the judge actually does decide. As we as we wait, uh, we are uh, bringing you the end of the murder trial for 20-year-old Keith Agee. We watched that play out last week here we on did. Court TV. Yesterday, we did. Or this week, actually. Yeah, oh, it seems oh, like last week. <laughs> I know. <laughs> uh, but, and of course, and rightfully so, a jury found him guilty of first-degree murder for shooting that beautiful young woman there, Brooklyn Sims, only 18 years while she was working at the Home Team Depot. He did take the stand in his own defense, and he testified at trial. He told the jury that uh, he felt hurt and betrayed and mad when Sims turned his back on him after he confronted her about this positive STD test results. So what did he have to say to himself after he was convicted? Sentencing uh, he, hearing. Yeah, yeah, at the sentencing hearing, um, he did address the judge. Let's watch. I would like to say that Guilty, guilty verdict. The charge carries a mandatory with life. So I would like the family to know that anything that I say is from the bottom of my heart. You know, I seek a sympathy and I seek a sorrow. I would like to apologize to the family. And this what needs to say I'm sorry. I can't ask for forgiveness because that's selfish. I can't expect her not to hate me because it's the roles are reversed. Anybody in different shoes feel different ways. If she can't forgive me, I completely understand more than anything. I just want her to know that through our past relationship with Boo, 
things that have happened, I'm grateful to still have um, had her, have had her in my life. And things that she's done for me have not went without consideration in my heart. I think about Brooklyn every night. Every night before I go to sleep, I pray. I pray for Casey. I pray for Brooklyn. I have regret is the understatement for this. If I could reverse the roles, I would take the place. I had to live with this decision for the rest of my life, and I accept that. I just hate the fact that my family has to go through this. My family also has to go through this, but I made this decision. Still with us, Josh Shipper and uh, Jack Rice. Okay, um, the defendant tried to apologize. Would you um, make? Yeah, I yeah, felt it, make... right? I mean, uh, he, I didn't he know. regrets this. This ever? I of hope so. He but he didn't seem like it on the witness stand. That's what I can't jive together at all. Where Jack or Josh, did either of you watch how he was this almost like reliving it, smiling as he was telling the jury what happened on the witness stand? Go for it, Josh. Yeah, so the, and both Jack and I have prepped lots of clients, and lots of times the prep is how are we going to talk about such awful subject matter? And sometimes you want it to be really authentic, and sometimes you want it to be a little bit more clinical. And I don't think that worked out really well uh, for him today or in, in this case because I wanted to hear his real loss. I wanted to hear the real sorrow about making a mistake that is going to affect him every single day till he dies, a mistake he acknowledged right away. We're talking about somebody who made confessions to law enforcement about the worst mistake that he's made. Uh, so this trial, I think, had a lot more to do with managing sentences or the long, slow plea than anything else. And there was a disagreement by, from the state and the defense as to what the sentence should be. And since they couldn't agree, they decided to have a trial. Um, I wanted to see a lot more. I worry that his lack of emotions uh, is kind of the opposite of mitigation, and it actually is going to aggravate the court when it comes uh, to disposition. One thing that I picked up on Jack was his uh, comment about his family has to go through this as well. Well, part of his family is old Sheila. Mama, who was on those text threads saying, kill him, if you don't kill him, you're a blank. Um, I wonder if we fast forward to her trial, which is coming up, I believe, in February, um, is he going to be a defense witness to come on and say, I did this, I did this, I did this? It would make a lot of sense, because if we look at what it was that she said, it's horrifying. I mean, that's the problem in a case like this. When you look at what it is that the mom does in this particular case, how do you justify that? Especially when you have the fact that there was no STD, but even if there were an STD, the problem that you have is that this is never acceptable under any, any, any circumstances at all. I think if we think about the failure that happened in this case, 
that happened in this young man's case is exactly what Josh was talking about. The problem is, is that there are times if you're forced into a trial, there's no offer of any kind. And what you're really trying to do is take the time to stretch out what happened and explain the brutality of what this meant and how this impacted everything. The problem that we have from him is that he, he came across as clinical. What he never did, what he never did was he never, he never showed the real loss. He never showed the real brutality of what this has done to everything around him and to all of the people. Instead, it came across as oddly manipulative. And the problem is there's nothing worse than that. So they've got to reconsider how they handle the next trial and make sure that they use him, dare I say it that way, use him to explain that the fault was his and he's the one who drove this and not mom. He's already going to be down the pike. That's the problem. And his testimony in her trial is the grenade. It goes either way and could blow up no matter what perspective, the jury could just get angry no matter what comes out. Oh, absolutely. There's only really one sentence for Keith Agee here with first degree premeditated murder conviction. That's life without parole. He will spend behind bars in Florida there. Um, but still, he can cooperate, right? I mean, there's what motive is it, I guess, for him to now? Well, he's not going to sink his Which, mom. Right. Yeah. yeah. The motive is mom. You would the think motive that, is trying to this help is court. <laughs> This is Court TV. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> All right, break time. Uh, we are still waiting the decision by the judge in Nassau, Bahamas. Matt Johnson is there. As soon as something happens, we'll head there live and get uh, the decision by that judge. Plus, up next. Up next. The judge's decision for uh, oh, we Keith already gave Agee. It away. Well, yeah. you gave it away, but My we're going to watch it. Uh, okay, as soon as we'll we watch get it up both. Right, stay with us. We are moving closer to trial in the case against doomsday prophet Chad Daybell. Prosecutors say they will seek the death penalty against him. Investigators have recovered human remains at Chad Daybell's residence. There's no way, Morgan, I should ever come up with this. His wife, Lori Valla Daybell, has already been convicted. Now, will her husband end up with the same fate? It's just so hard to know where the truth ends. It's the doomsday prophet, Chad Daybell, on trial. Welcome back to Court TV Live. We are awaiting that judge's decision in the Bahamas. Will Lindsay Shiver travel home for Christmas to be with her three children? And this is a live look in Nassau. At that courthouse, Matt Johnson's inside there waiting for the judge's decision. He's going to um, hustle out as soon as we have an answer. A lot at stake here. In fact, Matt uh, passed along that Lindsay was in the courtroom before the judge mm -hmm. took the bench and um, appeared to be extremely nervous. It was very and, emotional. And during her estranged husband's Zoom testimony, she was nodding her head, disagreeing with what he was saying. Yeah, and uh, I'm sure irate because had he gotten on there and said, I don't mind either way, boom, this would have been a right. done deal. Now the judge has something to think about. So we will monitor that as soon as Matt is out of the courthouse. We will check in with him. That's right. And in the meantime, we're bringing you the final moments of the STD revenge killing trial that took place in Pensacola, Florida. We heard the defendant, Keith Agee, apologize to the victim's family. But of course, this, at the end of the day, this would be up to the judge to have the final word. Uh, on this, let's listen to the sentencing now. Mr. Agee, as I sat through the, the testimony, and even especially your testimony, frankly, it, it's rare to have such a track record of what your thoughts were, what someone's thoughts were, what they intended to do, the acts they took to do it, and the culmination of it. It's rare that premeditated murder is literally laid out right in front of the jury. This was the textbook definition of a premeditated murder. Because you got mad and blamed her for something that, in, in disgusting irony, wasn't even her fault. And had you taken any time to think about it, you would have found that out. But instead, you did what you did. You came over here with one purpose, and you 
fulfilled that purpose, traumatizing everybody in that store. We had to see it, hear it, run from it. People got hurt. The jury found that you weren't responsible for an intentional battery on two of those people. Whether they were hurt from fragments or from getting run out of the store, none of that happens if it's not for you. And that's the minimum part of it. The trauma that these people are going to live with, having had dealt with that, having to deal with that for the rest of their lives, with the noises, with the crowds, with the evidence pretty conclusively pointed out, you unloaded that gun until it jammed. And you were fired at least, I believe there were, by the testimony, was there were three more casings or three more bullets in the gun, plus another one by the side of the road. Seven shots. And you, you would have kept going, two in the back of the head. And just cold blood. And broad daylight in the middle of a store with coworkers, with customers. Terror that you inflicted on everybody that was around is, is unthinkable. And unfortunately, that by your decision, then you had so much time to think about it. You chose not just to end her life, but to throw yours away, to throw away the life that your daughter would have known. Because she's not going to get to know you very well from prison. I hope that she's able to have some relationship with you if that's what her caretakers want. But you forfeited your role in her life. And the tidal wave effect of what you did will reverberate with all these people for the rest of their lives. And with you as well. The jury having found you guilty of first degree murder, I adjudicate you guilty of that, sent you to life in prison, credit for 132 days. 518 in court costs, 150 public defender application and fee. Is there anything else the state believes in the There you are. Defense. There you are. The financial obligations will be reduced to judgment lien. We have 30 days to appeal. We do not have an attorney with one on Okay, there was um, life in prison, and as the judge said, lives thrown away, not only her life. His daughter's life, life uh, is now without a father and a mother. It's just a horrible. Final thoughts here, Josh Schiffer, Jack Rice. Jack, first. I try to imagine the negotiations that were taking place underneath this, because why is it that this case goes to trial? Contemplate what we have, where this young man immediately says, I did it. And let me tell you how I did it. And then he comes in and testifies in this case. That tells you there was essentially no offer to negotiate a plea. Now, if, if I'm going to be the cynic and the criminal defense attorney, I would also argue this. What is the motivating factor or why would there ever be a motivating factor to sit down and talk to the police in the first place and tell them what happened simply because you want to bear your soul if there is no way back from that space? He's going to serve life in prison, and yet he was the one who acknowledged what he did, stupid as it was, horrible as it was, and then came in and told the jury or the judge everything else. He said everything that he could in the case, and yet he is serving life. So it sort of tells me a couple of things. There was the negotiations that went nowhere, and then it also had the piece that said, once they have everything, what's the motivation of the state to negotiate on their end? Yep. Josh? Yeah, yeah. normally this case would be just like Jack's talking about where you would really lean hard on, let's not have a trial, we're guilty. Let's do a mitigation dance. Let's get this sentence down. In this case though, with the mom still being out there, that's what changes the entire dynamic because it's really hard for this young man to, to fall on his sword most effectively without having the certainty of how he benefits his mother's case. And the state's not gonna give him what he wants until they have to. They're gonna let him dangle out there and make their cases as strong as possible. That's their obligation. So this was a really complex one from the defense side, even though the facts are so plain.